Hello and welcome to Absolutely Not. My name is Katrina Stroll. My pronouns are they, she, he, and I am so grateful that you are here with us today. If you appreciate the work that I do here or elsewhere, real quick, please visit the Support the Mission page on my website. There are several options to choose from, so please choose one. The keywords for this episode are intersectionality, reciprocity, and entitlement. I encourage y'all to look up the definitions of these words and compare them to the definitions that you carry with you on a daily basis. If you need help comparing, please let me know. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp allows you to connect with one of 24,000 therapists licensed therapist in a safe and private online environment. You pay a low flat fee for unlimited therapy with your therapist. Visit www.betterhelp.com slash absolutely not for more information and to get 10% off your first month. This link can be found in the show notes. Today's episode is titled, Are You Paying Me to Be Your Black Friend? And I'm excited to get into it with our amazing special special guest today, Ra Ra Rollins. He him. He recently completed MA studies in counseling and mental health for mental health and wellness as the only black cis man in a cohort of over a hundred peers. He also holds an AAS in menswear design. He worked in the fashion industry as a designer, illustrator, and production manager in the United States, Canada, and London, England. Often the only Black intersectional person in the room, he recognized a need to create spaces where a broad range of people are considered and made to feel safe, heard, and supported. He identifies as queer, gay, and has an invisible disability. Thank you so much for being here today. Hey, thanks for having me. This is really cool. I appreciate it. Ooh, first of all, you look amazing. So thank you for bringing that energy here. <laughs> so do you. And the energy of the episode title, um, why are we talking about this today? I think we're talking about this today uh, uh, for very personal reasons. I... Um, and working part-time as a psychotherapist. And um, my marketing is pretty clear about who I'm prioritizing. And that's for both personal reasons and professional reasons. Um, and we have to take an, and we had to do an internship during, during school, unpaid, um, that is necessary to graduate. And so um, a lot of my clients were taking on kind of under duress. Um, and so there's a heavy lift that comes with being a black clinician when you're working with um, clients who clearly did, potentially did not read your marketing. And first and foremost, um, don't understand that you come into therapy as a practitioner with social justice at the forefront. Um, and secondly, that they are potentially taking up space that was clearly defined for someone else. Um, I want to say, I want to preface, uh, none of my views are the views of the site that currently employs me. Um, and if one of my clients should see this video, um, I should, please bring it up. Please let's discuss. Um, this is, you know, this is, this is clinical work. This is, um, entitlement that we're, that we're discussing right now. Mm -hmm. I have so many questions, but the first question I have for you is, well, the first statement I have for you is, I want to thank you so much for encouraging people that you work with to ask questions. Because, you know, there are a lot of people who don't want to have that conversation about what you believe in as the whole human being that you are. So those people that are afraid about having conversations with the people they work with, and about what they believe is at the forefront of their own work, what would you say to them? Should they be afraid of having the conversations you're encouraging? I don't think anyone should be afraid to have any conversation in any space. We are humans, regardless of what space we're in. Um, 
I get this question all the time. Is that appropriate to talk about with your clients? And I'm like, if we're not talking about inappropriate, hard to discuss topics, what are we doing? Why are we here? We can't breeze over things that may both affect the client as, you know, getting towards the goals that they've set, as well as affect the clinician. You know, if my mental health and physical health is not sound, I can't, I can't engage a client. Um, and so I think it's necessary and appropriate to always have those conversations as openly and as honestly as possible. Thank you so much for that insight. There are a lot of people who are possibly taking notes as I am, and I hope they continue into those conversations. One of the key words that you brought into this space with you today is inappropriate. When was the last time somebody defined inappropriate differently than you? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Sunday? <laughs> Uh, I, I saw my family on Sunday, and I am just wholly inappropriate to them. But I think that I'm very inappropriate to a lot of people, um, and I love it. I love that space. Uh, it's a sweet spot. Why is it inappropriate? What is it doing? What is it triggering? What's going on? It's therapy to, to have inappropriate conversations. Um, we're just not used to having them outside of the therapy space. And that's perhaps because it's not a safe space that we're in, or we don't see anyone who looks like us in the space. Um, there's a lot of different reasons, but inappropriate conversations are the only way that change happens. Because let me tell you, there are a lot of my identities, there are a lot of things that I present as that people are immediately seeing as inappropriate. Please don't talk about race. How? How could I not? How could I not? How? <laughs> and you talked about the last time you um, had to redefine uh, inappropriate with someone. When was the last time you had to tell someone, I will be having this conversation with you, or we can't move forward? Yeah. Um, are you... Are you engaging a professional space or a personal space? Okay. Whichever space you'd like to speak about today. Um, I, I think personal spaces, um, because I think my personal life kind of defines the way that I engage my clinical life. Um, I find no discomfort in telling my blood family no, or um, this is inappropriate and this is why, because it affects me in these ways. Um, and I had to have that conversation again on Sunday. Sunday was <laughs> a day. <laughs> it was a day. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. It's Saturday. My mom got married on. Nope. It was Sunday. Sorry. It was this past Sunday. Uh, there were a lot of inappropriate conversations that I had with someone, with other people to establish boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of uncomfortable and appropriate conversations that were point in my direction that I had to kind of deflect. Pointed in my direction that I had to um, deflect. There are so many times when people are pointed in our direction and they bring they bring their own keywords, they bring their own definitions, they bring a lot of stuff. You talked about the clients that for some reason or another were pointed to you but they're not the people that you were marketing towards and were taking up space that weren't meant for you. How do you redirect those people to spaces that are meant for them? Yeah, um, I think with, with my clients that I have now, I love them. They're wonderful. We do great work. Um, what I've decided post-graduation and post not having to do an internship any longer um, is that I have a very firm boundary, and that is that I will not take on specific clients any longer. Um, so redirect is usually a very uncomfortable conversation. Um, it usually takes up a lot of my time. There's usually a lot of explaining. Um, and this is free work, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I'm, I, you can't work with me because there's only one of me. Um, but there are tons of other therapists, other clinicians, that I can refer you out to. Here are some resources for you. And the question is always, well, why I want to work with you? Or, or is there another black man that I that you can refer me to? And I'm like, mm, why does it need to be a black man? And two, no, 
that's the whole point. There's only a few of us. And so we're trying to cut, uh, carve out space for our communities that either aren't used to therapy, um, are terrified, don't know what it is, have never seen themselves in these positions. Um, yeah. So it's uh, the redirect is simply a referral. I, I would refer someone out if um, they were having um, paternity issues. You know, that's not something that I specialize in. So it would be kind of the same conversation um, in that sense. Mm. And if you don't mind being specific, what are the types of clients that you are now redirecting? Yeah, um, I am redirecting uh, clients that have ancestry from the caucus mountains. There are literally any other therapist you can work with. Um, and when you're dealing with smaller towns, smaller spaces that already don't have a big black population or POC population, and then you come into my industry where there's just none, sometimes I'm potentially in that space, the only. Um, and so it's just a necessary conversation to have. And when you have those conversations, it sounds like some people are understanding, some people are inquisitive. Have you ever had a person become hostile or felt entitled to your services? Yeah. Uh, I think hostility comes in a lot of different ways. Um, I think I speak very, I think my gift is that I speak very clearly, concisely, very directly. Uh, and if someone continues to push against a very clear no, um, I push back just as intensely as they are. Um, so yes, that has happened. Um, which leads us back to kind of the title of this art of this episode you know why are you coming to me <laughs> like t why are you coming to me what can i help you with do you need a black friend do you need to understand a community that you've not taken perhaps strides to include yourself in work with love protect um you know, when it comes right down, I'll be your black friend. But the amount of money that my site charges for my services is not appropriate. We're moving into, like, uh, reparations at this point. I will happily be your black friend. It's going to cost you way more than my uh, session fee. Mm. And I, I love that you are defining these relationships with these people because – for a very long time, ooh, for centuries, there is a certain demographic who has believed that they are entitled to certain information, to certain services from everybody else, from everybody else. Um, what kind of messaging are you sending to yourself kind of internally when you say no to these people who feel that they should get access to you? It's, it's terrifying, to be honest. Um... I live in a capitalist society. I have a ridiculous amount of student debt, and I'm trying to work. I'm trying to make adult money. And so to have these really radical, they're not radical, but that's the word that I'll use, because that's the word that I think most people will understand. To have these radical thought processes and business, um, and make these type of business decisions, it's really terrifying. Um, it's terrifying to understand this is appropriate for me, this is how I protect my own mental health and wellness. Um, but also doing that calculation of like, what if this gets out onto LinkedIn? Am I going to be able to find a DEI job with people understanding that um, I am prioritizing uh, community, marginalized communities, as opposed to everyone, right? We start talking, we, I, I immediately start thinking about like all lives matter as opposed to black lives matter. It's kind of that same conversation, right? Like, sure, all lives matter. But right now, I'm focusing on these lives because I've not seen enough focus being put on them. Mm -hmm. Now, I have the resource to do that, to offer that. Please, please don't take up that resource. 
and I love that you used the word radical because this is normal shit. Me saying no to you is a normal, like normal, com- just because it's coming through mel- melanation, to- it doesn't make no difference. But the word radical is what people use to describe a, lo- a lot of what you talked about, especially in business strategy, especially in like making money conversations. Have you received support from people who um, either went through the cohort with you or your colleagues who are now in their own businesses? Yeah, I have received support and this is key, um, behind the scenes, right? Uh, so if you follow me on LinkedIn, I don't think that I'm radical. I think I'm speaking from the viewpoint of a black cis man, gay, who's six, three, who's 200 pounds, who watched George Floyd get lynched on television. This is my viewpoint of, of, of America, right? And I'm, I'm getting the likes, if you will, but then I'm also getting text messages and DMs um, where people want me to tell their stories or um, uh, are applauding what I'm saying. Um, and that's wonderful. I'm so excited that it's resonating, but also I'm just like one crazy mouth black dude on the internet. You know, like, who the fuck cares if I have a, a master's degree or a PhD? I'm still a black dude. Um, so no one's listening. It takes, like, it takes everyone's voice. And also, I can't tell your story the way that you can tell your story. I, I, it doesn't have the emotionality. So, yes, there's support. But I think that caveat is necessary. The support... Um, I'm not just doing this for me. I'm doing this for a broad range of people. I, I speak out for a broad range of people. Um, but it is also necessary uh, for, for others to speak out. And I hope that, uh, I hope that I'm just like, inspi- uh, I didn't even want to say that, inspiring people to tell their story. And if, if, if certain people watch this, I hope they know I'm talking their stories are really really super important and really kind of devastating and overwhelming um and if they're not told then no one knows and i am tearing up because i i too create content and um i get some dms and i get some stuff and i and i i also encourage people to use their voice that is given to them and the amount of people that are just so afraid to, that are just, like, I, I remember getting people from the community saying, like, hey, you need to pipe down or you'll never find a job again. Like, you need to pipe down. Like, people can see this. Do you know people can see this? Obviously, I posted it. <laughs> <laughs> how have you, how do you respond to those kinds of messages? Have you ever received messages like, like, hey, you need to pipe down? Absolutely, yeah. Um, fuck you. <laughs> Like, the world that I engage every day is wild. I, I don't know what world you're engaging that if, if you feel safe doing what you're doing, great. But I don't feel safe being quiet anymore. Being quiet also got me nowhere. Um, I'm very direct, like I said. Fuck you. If it's not working for you, I'm unfollow. I, I will say it's real tea. It's it's terrifying to say something that affects my life that directly goes against what media says or um, uh, the majority of people. Um, uh, discounting my opportunity, my potential opportunity for jobs, it's always at the forefront of my brain. That it's terrifying to say something and think that this could this potentially not allow me to get a future job of some sort. And I appreciate you um, putting that in here as well. Like we're not telling y'all it's not scary. <laughs> it's very scary to do this shit. But um, I I would so much rather be this kind of scared than the other type of scared. You know what I mean? Like that I'm not living my life to the fullest extent that I'm connecting with people who are, are not about this shit because I'm being fake in spaces that they can see. 
one of the one of the um, questions I have for you, or that's rolling around in my head, because you said the messages from media, the messages from all around us are telling us that certain people should not have a voice. Are there any messages that you tell yourself to kind of deflect those messages from all around? Uh, <laughs> I just go back to fuck you. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I process a lot. I'm constantly thinking. I take very long walks and I'm just thinking and I'm trying to come to the reason that something works for me or doesn't work for me. Um, and so when I see something that's just like poured into me by outlets that I did not necessarily even ask, I didn't give you consent to even offer me this, I process it. Does this work for me or does it not? Um, and if it doesn't, I have extremely strict boundaries. If it's not working for me, it's got to go. A message. I can give you consent to offer me this. There are a lot of messages, especially on social media, like, well, you posted it. Let me, let, you should want my input. You should want anybody on the planet's input. And it's giving, what's it giving? It's giving, well, she was wearing that, so she was asking. Like, that's the type of, vibe that I get from that I, mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I had to do a lot of rewiring around that in my brain have you had to do un any rewiring lately constant <laughs> constant rewiring I, I, I constantly feel like I live in two dimensions mm -hmm. right the dimension that I think all of us engage but then this queer gay black dimension that some people can step into but other people don't even know care it's like code switching, basically, where you're kind of bouncing between these spaces. And when I bounce back into the safe space, the comfortable space, the queer space, there's a constant check, a reality check. Is this appropriate for you? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. You know? So it's, it's constant rewiring. Mm -hmm. And I love that you're talking about the spaces that other people are not seeing as the standard. Like if black queer spaces were the standard, there'd be a lot less, a lot less of violence. <laughs> there'd be a lot less. But um, I appreciate that that's still a priority in your life. Like you're saying, this is a prioritized space in my life, and the community there is prioritized in my life. Yeah. What did your life look like before you prioritized that space? Were you the same person? Oh, absolutely not. Uh, I can't really tell you what my life looked like before because I was disassociated. I was on autopilot. I was not living. Um, it was boring. It was, it was, <laughs> it wasn't me. You know, I'm finding out who I am now. Um, I, I, there was this moment where I graduated from fashion school and I did what other people wanted me to do. And it got me, I, I had a great level of success in that industry. But I look back and I think, why well, just do what I wanted? And I'm taking that energy with graduating here now. Um, just making sure that everything is appropriate for me. Mm. And to the leaders in organizations who may be listening to this, hopefully they are, um, what would you say to them or what some advice you would give to them about allowing other people to assess the appropriateness and like of what they can bring into the workplace and even if the space in general is appropriate for them. Yeah. Um, I think this is a, a great segue into like DEIB work where I'm often the diversity hire, uh, especially because of the niche markets that I've worked in. Um, so it's necessary to sure have diversity. Make sure there's more than one black guy in the room. That's it. You know, that's a thing. Um, and then when you hire me, listen, engage what I'm, what I'm telling you. If it doesn't make sense, ask me why I'm offering that information to you. Ask questions. If you still don't want to move forward, whatever, whatever you know, whatever it is we're engaging, that's fine. But. Uh, you're hiring diverse people so that you have a diverse voice. And if you're not engaging those diverse voices, then you're failing. 
you're failing. And this is always so interesting to me. Black people have money. <laughs> Indian people have money. Latin, Latinx people have money. Like you're missing out. You're missing out on money by not incorporating all the voices that need to be incorporated. Um, so you know, if you want to stick with what you're doing, great. But you, you're missing out on money. What's wrong with you? Why are you doing this? And it is Pride Month, so I think about all those corporations who have put out all these ads this month. My goodness, you didn't have not one. You did not have not one in the room. And could uh, when you see those advertisements, could you think about, or maybe they did have one and they didn't listen. Have you ever been the one in the space and they just didn't listen? Like you told them, like, this is not going to work. Absolutely. I think there's two situations that I've been in. The one situation where I don't feel empowered to speak or I'm literally terrified to speak mm -hmm. um, because you're in a closed room in a corporate tower and you're freezing from the AC. And, you know, like it's, it's very visceral to be like literally the only one in the room and you being like, this shit is whack. What is happening? But if you say that, there's no one else to back you up. So you just don't say it. And no one asks. I think the other thing is when you say something, people don't respect. I have a master's degree. I still have people arguing with me about mental health. I think it's hilarious. That's not to suggest that I'm uh, an expert. I still have tons to learn. But we don't have a master's degree in mental health. What are we arguing about here? What's going on? You know what I mean? In the same way, I would never argue with someone who has a, a, a specialty or expertise in something that they spent time and effort in relationships and physical health to, to strive towards, right? And I think that has to do with entitlement. That has to do with just like a lack of respect, respect when I walk into the room. Mm -hmm. And that is something that can easily be internalized, that can easily like, oh, there's something wrong with me. Like maybe I'm speaking out my way, but not. And it has taken me a long time to extract that from myself. How, are you done extracting that from yourself? Never. I have to engage the, I have to engage the world. And so it will always be imparted upon me. I have to constantly cleanse myself. Are you worthy? Did you say the right thing? Are you sure you're right? And I have to extract that. I know what the fuck I'm talking about. Yeah? So I'm constantly doing that all the time. Again, only one in the room. And that, that's interchangeable, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't just have to be black. It can be women, women identified. It could be transgender. It could be a mature person. It, there's a wide range of only being the only one in the room. The same outcome is negative, mm. right? It, it constantly has um, a negative impact on a person's mental health, for sure. Mm. You can't just be. And you, you have made emphasis on all the reflections you have made throughout your time in any space that you've been in, whether it be design, whether it be mental health. And I appreciate you bringing that here because a lot of people believe at a certain age or a set of point in your life, you're done. You're done learning. You're done developing. You're done reflecting. And I appreciate you making emphasis of it. One of the things I want to make emphasis on before we wrap up today is communication, because you talked about your direct form of communication and also being able to process whether or not this conversation is going somewhere with intent. Yeah. How do you kind of vocalize that to another person when you, whether it be, oh, you are really tripping right now. Like, I have no idea where we're going in this conversation or, hey, I actually don't know where we're going in this conversation. What do you want from me? How do you engage them? Yeah, I think that um, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. I think communication does not necessarily have to do with vocalizing first. I am effectively a researcher. My job is pattern recognition. And in order to recognize patterns, I have to collect data. And I am constantly doing that. I am constantly listening. I am constantly watching. And sometimes that takes years, right? If a, if a company says they're going to do something and a year has passed and they still not done it, I'm recognizing a pattern. 
And so communication would be for me to be able to present that pattern after I've done the listening, after I've done the, the calculation of what's going on. Um, and then it's, it really is like therapy. Sometimes it's confrontational. Hey, you said your goals. By the way, we've already set our goals, right? Because that's part of what's going on. <laughs> what do you want? What, why am I here? What's going on? What's the end goal? Great, we're aligned. But if this is your end goal and you're doing this, something's off. We're never going to get here. Right? And that's, that's, that takes awkward conversations. Very awkward conversations. And then the data collection starts again once you present that information. Hmm. Awkward conversations that some people may consider inappropriate, but that's for y'all to discuss together. I love that so much. There are going to be people who listen to this episode and say, you know what? Let's set some fucking goals in this bitch. Like, let's let's have some awkward and inappropriate conversations because I have seen these patterns and I do not like them. They don't align. What would be the top three tips you would share with those people about going into those awkward conversations? Yeah, I would say, first of all, set the goals and ensure that the goals are actually realistic. You ain't, you're not going to start working out five days a week. You're not. <laughs> you might start two days a week. So set the goal and make sure it's available with the resources that you have. I think the third thing is account. The second thing is accountability. Ensure that everyone understands the goal and their part in ensuring that goal happens. Um, and then I think the third thing is to constantly listen, constantly involve people that, um, may not have ever been involved, right? So if we're talking about a, a giant corporation, have you talked to the cleaning staff about what they need, how they can feel safe? Uh, is there a part of this, uh, this machine, right? So I think it's, it's like engaging everyone, mm -hmm. regardless of how important you think they are or are not, and regardless of their um, salary range, what hours they work, where they work from. Um, I think we, we constantly forget that leaders um, are not the only ones that can and should make decisions. Oh, I hope you motherfucker. I <laughs> hope somebody heard that today because if everybody in the same boardroom who went to the same school, who went to the same experiences, if they're the only people making decisions, then the same decisions going to be made. Oh, thank you so much for bringing that into this space. Are there any last minute sprinkles that you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, no, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for giving a thought. Thanks for being dope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much and somebody in the chat said this was great thank you so much for everyone who is listening now or to the recording Rara's information will be in the show notes so you'll be able to click follow him on TikTok because you'll be able to see what we were talking about in this space today but in real time so thank you so much for being here for being an amazing inspiration to anybody who is listening keep saying Absolutely not to anything unaligned. We will see you next time. Bye.